Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years, and Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venozzi. Good evening and thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Brianna Venozzi. Hot summer months are a known precursor for spikes in crime, but many cities across New Jersey and the country have been consistently reporting trauma after trauma long before the heat waves set in. A nationwide outbreak of violent crime, more specifically, involving guns. The experts who track it point to the pandemic for worsening the causes behind the violence. In Trenton, a double shooting over the holiday, injuring two 16-year-olds, one fatally. One man was killed and another injured in a Friday morning shooting in Camden. And in Patterson, the city is on target for one of its most violent years with more shooting victims than 2020, one of the worst on recent record. Joanna Gagas reports. Far too many guns on our streets, I can tell you, infested, drugs and guns, and that's what we are focused on. Mayor Andre Saya today addressed the rise of gun violence in his city of Patterson this past weekend and over the last several months. There have been six violent crime incidents in just the last six days with 10 victims. And that's not unique to New Jersey. It, it, there's an absolutely massive surge, somewhere in the 40 to 60 percent increase in rate of sales in 2020 over 20, 2019, and that surge has seemed to continue into 2021 as well. Michael Anesti says the increase in gun sales has contributed to a 20 to 30 percent rise in gun violence victims from year to year. Officials in Patterson point to a lack of police presence due to COVID, but this year the city's on track to outpace last year's shootings. 163 people were shot in 2020, according to data from the state police. This year, already more than 100 people shot and it's only mid-year. We're conducting special investigations and you'll see the results. We're going to bring those violent offenders to justice. City officials say they're doubling down on their policing efforts. And while there's a new class of police recruits starting this week, Public Safety Director Jerry Spezial understands his officers can't fix this alone. Whether it be law enforcement strategies, whether it be community collaboration, whether it be partnerships, all of those things together is how we will respond to the violence. Groups like Ceasefire and the Patterson Healing Collective are on the ground daily trying to offer young people alternatives to gang activity and retaliatory measures. We out there continually, you know, uh, reaching out, offering, you know, uh, other resources, other avenues, but there has to be a presence and that presence has to be there to offer something different. We're at, I would say, at least not, if not 95%, uh, preventing retaliation and re-injury um, uh, only, only in a short period of time with, with less than a year. We've had over um, close to 90 participants um, come through our doors and so far our record's been good with helping them maintain a balance. The organization was started in October, modeled after and trained by the Newark Community Street Team that's had great success bringing the rate of shootings down in Newark. There's tons of research, tons of evidence that shows that community-based public safety has a lot of promise. Public health responses have a lot of pro promise. There's um, you know programs like the Hospital-Based Violence Intervention Program, like ours, that's evidence-based. The Patterson Healing Collective is confident that without their involvement over this past year, the number of shootings would have been significantly higher than what we're seeing right now and they say hiring more police is not the answer. A lot of times it's a criminal justice response where it's like lock them up, throw away the key and we're trying to change that, shift that perspective, talking about how do we build the infrastructure of the community? How do we get mental health and crisis intervention at the key point of where it's in the forefront? Anesti says the pandemic has depleted resources, making gun violence worse. It removed folks access to a lot of the resources and activities and things that might otherwise reduce the odds that they're going to end up in an armed conflict. These community groups are calling for significant funding once Patterson 
Maine receives its allocation from the American Rescue Plan Act. We see these young people and we ask them, hey, how many people have been shot? If there's like 10 people on a block, that's a problem, right? So if the, the city officials are not willing to put this at the forefront, then that's, we're not going to address this. Mayor Saya says his office is reviewing how these groups will be funded. In Patterson, I'm Joanna Gagas, NJ Spotlight News. Cities like Patterson will be looking to state leaders to prioritize those federal dollars. And it'll be a topic front and center for the gubernatorial candidates this fall. Governor Murphy today courting Latino voters and touted his progressive policies that helped communities of color during the pandemic. Part of an effort to shore up his base. But will he still be able to rely on that record come November? Senior political correspondent David Cruz reports. It's been a reliable voting block for Phil Murphy, 82% in 2017, and the campaign expects to do just as well come November. Today's endorsement by the New Jersey Coalition of Latino Pastors and Ministers is an early step towards that goal. The stuff that we've done in our three and a half years that have impacted almost everybody in the state but in each case with a disproportionate impact on the Latino communities. Sheila and I are absolutely committed to continuing the work with you. You have our absolute commitment. To be sure, many of these pastors are connected to Democrats in and out of office, but you don't get over 80% of a block without delivering on some policy promises. Free college tuition and financial aid for college students including so-called dreamers, driver's licenses for the undocumented, a game changer for thousands of workers, as well as nutrition and health programs for poor and immigrant communities through the state, not to mention millions more to undocumented residents through the Pandemic Relief Fund founded by the state's first lady. 21 percent's a huge voting block. That's the state's percentage of Latino residents. It's growing not only in size, but in diversity. Carlos Medina runs the statewide Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. He says Latinos are not just consumers, they're entrepreneurs and managers of companies. It's one of the departments that's really uh, got an A rating in the past four years has been the EDA. So I would argue that the EDA has helped a lot of undocumented Hispanic business owners which in turn have helped their undocumented workers. But progressives in the party say Murphy has come up short especially in a year where the state was flush with cash and handing over a billion dollars in Christmas tree items in the state budget. The administration put up $40 million in a state fund to help undocumented workers hit hard by the economic losses of COVID, a number even the governor admits is not enough. But this is an election year, and the governor's coalition includes some conservative Democrats, so he'll sometimes be forced to walk a fine line says NJ Spotlight News social justice reporter Monsi Alvarado. I think he has to. I, I think that's why he's being so careful about not signing this uh, bill on the detention, the ICE detentions, because I think there's a lot riding on this, right? Um, and even when he put out, his office put out the release on the money, the $40 million for undocumented immigrants, it was part of a larger release on how much money he was going to give to small businesses, et cetera. He didn't want that to be the focus. So he, I think he's very aware of what he needs, like what he should or should not do. He's very careful about some things at this point. But really, as some have pointed out, where else are you going to go when this is what Republican standard bearer Jack Cittarelli has to say about financial assistance for the undocumented. David, the last thing that legal citizens who are waiting month upon month upon month for their unemployment benefits want to hear is that tax dollars, whether state or federal, are being used for illegal immigrants. The last time a Republican governor won the Latino vote was in 2013, when Chris Christie got 51%. Of course, that was pre-Trump Christie at the height of his political powers and popularity. It's a recipe that Jack Cittarelli will have to try hard to replicate. I'm David Cruz, NJ Spotlight News. And Governor Murphy is taking some heat for attaching a personal message with his name to the $500 rebate checks being mailed out to eligible families this week. Critics are calling it an election year stunt. But you won't hear pushback from the heads of New Jersey's three level one trauma centers. 
all slated to share a pot of $450 million from Federal American Rescue Plan funds for pandemic-related upgrades. Cooper University Hospital in Camden, RWJ Barnabas Health's Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital in New Brunswick, and University Hospital in Newark will each receive up to $150 million to help them prepare for the next emergency. Leaders at all three facilities say, get this, they were stunned to find out the final budget included the cash. We asked University Hospital President and CEO Dr. Sharif Alnahal how he plans to use it. Dr. Alnahal, right off the bat, I just want to get your reaction to the fact that the hospital will be receiving this money because I would say it's probably fairly infrequent that uh, the organization gets funding that you don't know is coming your way. Thanks for having me on, uh, Brianna. So first of all, we're thrilled uh, that the governor, that legislative leadership, uh, and all members of the legislature uh, voted to uh, administer this funding to level one trauma centers. I think everybody recognized um, how meaningful our efforts were in coordinating the response, especially for hospital capacity. Uh, I think it was with that recognition that we got this incredible investment uh, and we're gonna make great use of that money in a new infrastructure at the hospital that will be more pandemic ready, but also meet the long-term healthcare needs of this community much better going forward. Yeah, so what are the plans? Uh, because the governor was pretty vague, calling it you know, money for emergency preparedness. And are there limitations on how you can spend the money? Well, we have to go on the guidance uh, from the Department of Health on how we spend the money and how much better it prepares us as hospitals, brick and mortar institutions, but also what more we can do for the community. And so I can tell you, we're already thinking very hard about how to spend the money when it comes to our infrastructure. We already have plans to build a new facility here. I know that this money will be crucial for that effort, but we have to make sure we consult with the community. We have a community advisory council and a community oversight board that is going to have meaningful oversight, but also engagement and involvement of the community in the process. But we're really looking forward to putting uh, the funds to good use. What can you tell us about that new construction? Are you hoping to focus it more toward other public health crises, uh, you know, future perhaps emergencies? Well, first of all, it was clear throughout this pandemic and even now that we don't have enough capacity to meet the need, the demand of health care in this community. So the very first thing we're going to do is expand our emergency room and then upgrade our emergency room and add hospital beds uh, and ultimately grow the capacity to see patients here. I think that's the most important measure. And it has everything to do with pandemic preparedness, because if you remember, we had to have a field medical station, a field hospital in Secaucus yeah. to help us transition patients after the pandemic. And so I think having the public hospital that serves the most vulnerable, be able to take on more patients with more beds, more staff, uh, all of that is gonna be necessary going forward. And then secondarily, of course, we're gonna be building other services that folks are gonna need uh, post-pandemic because of the public health issues that uh, have gone up since then, deferred care, delayed care, but also mental health and substance use issues that have only exploded, unfortunately. There's this idea that an emergent, you know, a crisis emerges and the money comes. Crisis over, money stops pouring in. Yeah, I think that's the type of short-term thinking that caused our public health infrastructure to either go underfunded or even deteriorate over time in some ways. Uh, and New Jersey is actually one of the better funded public health uh, states. You have a lot of states that haven't had a single dollar of additional investment in public health in decades, uh, who suffered even more through this pandemic. And so I think when it comes to uh, preparedness, that means also looking at issues around health equity uh, and the fact that just because somebody has Medicaid or relies on charity care, uh, that should not determine uh, the status of the healthcare infrastructure around them. In fact, they need even better and more healthcare. Uh, and so I think this is a nod toward equity in uh, the black and brown and very diverse community uh, that we serve going forward. Dr. Sharif Alnahal, always good to talk to you. Thanks so much for your time today. Thank you. Take care. For the first time since the early days of the pandemic, the state is reporting zero deaths related to COVID-19. The last time that happened was nearly 16 months ago on March 17th, 2020, 
two weeks after the state announced its first confirmed case of the coronavirus. The state is also reporting another 145 positive tests. Health leaders say the outbreak is leveling off as more people get fully vaccinated, more than 5 million as of today, and even with an increase in infections caused by the highly contagious new Delta variant. There's also new data tonight suggesting the Pfizer-BioNTech coronavirus vaccine is less effective against Delta, but it does prevent severe illness and hospitalization. In a June study conducted in Israel, the vaccine protected 64% of those who've had the shots from infection during an outbreak of the Delta strain. Now that's down 30% from data collected in May when the variant was less prevalent. But it was 94% effective at preventing serious symptoms during the same period. Methodology and data on which the findings are based have yet to be released. The new research is prompting health leaders there to push for more studies on the long-term efficacy of the vaccine and whether booster shots will be needed. Meanwhile, in Camden, an effort to build the city up by tearing down blighted homes. The initiative is called Camden Strong and targets about 300 unsafe buildings, starting in the Kramer Hill neighborhood and moving across the city. Mayor Vic Karstarfen says the demolition is part of his larger 100-day plan to rebuild a healthier community. It also calls for cleaning up illegal dumping and encouraging more residents to get involved in keeping their neighborhoods clean. The mayor says ridding the abandoned homes will also help with crime. They often serve as stash houses for drugs and firearms or easily conceal violent crimes like robbery or sexual assault. The project is being split into two phases over about two years and will cost roughly $15 million with funding help from the state. Well, a controversial state solar project is taking shape. Rhonda Schaffler is here with details and our top business stories. Rhonda. Brianna, among the bills now sitting on Governor Murphy's desk is one that would promote solar power in the state, but not everyone is satisfied with the legislation. The bill would encourage the building of large solar grids, which generate electricity at a lower cost than other solar projects, like solar panels on people's homes. Supporters say it's the large projects that will help New Jersey meet its clean energy goals. But as NJ Spotlight's Tom Johnson tells us, the legislation comes at a price. The problem is they lifted a cap uh, on how much can be spent on solar projects, and that could increase costs to ratepayers, which is uh, contrary to the administration's goal of keeping rates affordable. To dig deeper into this story, check out my colleague Tom Johnson's reporting on njspotlightnews.org. The development of wind power is another priority for the Murphy administration, and there's a plan in place to get workers trained for new jobs that will be available from the offshore wind industry. The state is awarding $3 million to Atlantic Cape Community College, which will develop a workplace training program for those jobs, the college aims to have a certified training program and facility up and running by the end of next year. The long holiday weekend was good for many businesses, but thousands of restaurants continue to struggle. And one lobbying group is pushing hard for more federal funding to help the industry, especially now that the Small Business Administration has closed the $28 billion Restaurant Revitalization Fund program. According to the Independent Restaurant Coalition, over 265,000 small restaurants still need financial help and are on the brink of permanent closure. The SBA's restaurant program provided grants for 101,000 restaurants, or about one third of the eligible applicants before running out of funding. Now, while that federal program has run dry, Governor Murphy recently signed legislation to provide more grants to New Jersey restaurants and the state's Economic Development Authority is still taking applications through mid-July for its Sustain and Serve program, which allows nonprofits to buy meals in bulk from New Jersey restaurants. Now, let's take a look at how Wall Street performed today. I'm Rhonda Schaffler, and those are your top business stories.
A surreal scene outside a home in Mount Laurel on Monday as police escorted a man from his home and into custody as roughly 100 people protested outside, all in response to a viral video that showed the man shouting racial slurs at neighbors. Mount Laurel police say 45-year-old Edward Cagney Matthews is charged with harassment and bias intimidation after a resident reported being continually harassed by him and provided footage showing Matthews also spit on the victim. Police spent hours in a tense standoff outside the home as protesters crowded outside shouting for him to show face and verbally confronting police. It all came to a head after officers entered Matthew's home to escort him out. That's when reports say protesters threw plastic bottles and used pepper spray hitting both Matthews and the officers as they left. No one was injured. Well, after extended school closures caused limited learning during the pandemic, newly released standardized test results show Newark students struggled this year. And the district had the information, but failed to share it with the public. Nearly 80% of third graders and almost 90% of fourth graders would not meet the passing score on state math exams, according to a district analysis of the tests. And they likely continued to slip behind as remote learning stretched on. Yet the district took steps steps that intentionally or not withheld the pandemic's full impact on its student body from families and the community. Our content partner Patrick Wall from Chalkbeat has been following the story. Patrick, at least according to what you reported here from these findings, the damage is done. These results are pretty alarming. Yeah, you know, this is really the first glimpse that we've had of how the pandemic has affected Newark students academically. And this isn't surprising. This has been the case at the national and the state level. Remote learning had a really detrimental effect on a lot of students learning. But what this shows is that this has really set back Newark students, at least a subset of them, pretty extensively. This is just looking at math and just for a couple of grades. But based on what the, the district saw on these diagnostic tests, it looks like the vast majority of students were not expected to pass the state exams if they took them. So there were a number of public meetings, school board meetings. The superintendent, Roger Leone, was asked about this. And when they were confronted with it, what did the district say? Well, part of the issue is that the district hasn't really revealed these publicly, um, at least at these board meetings that have happened. Um, and this is something that I think other districts are gonna see as well, that there were not state tests that students would normally take for the past two years because of the pandemic, they were canceled. And so districts were giving their own tests. And that means it's really up to districts if they're gonna share that data with the public or not. And in this case, so far, the district really hasn't. And what some community members I spoke with said is that they don't blame the district for this learning loss. That's something that students are seeing across the country. But if the district doesn't make it public, it's going to be hard to track students' progress catching up and to hold the district accountable for doing that. It also wasn't just test scores, right? I mean, you spoke with a couple of folks, some anonymously, about other things that were a little less than transparent within the district. Yeah, I think that, you know, definitely I've seen in Newark, and I'm sure this is the case elsewhere, we're going to have to take a lot of the data from over the past year or so with a huge grain of salt because so much of it was taken differently. So, for example, with attendance in a lot of places, including Newark, students were marked present if they just uh, typed into Google Classroom, like hello in the morning, if they reached out to a teacher in email not actually showing up for virtual classes. And then with grade uh, report cards, some teachers were saying they weren't allowed to give failing grades, which again, there might be good educational reasons for that. But I think what it's going to do is make it harder to know the real impact on students because we don't have very good data. Sure, yeah, and we've certainly heard that anecdotally and anonymously from teachers as well. So what is the plan to make up for this academic loss? Well, what we've heard here in Newark so far, they're, they are doing summer school. They've also talked about doing after school programs and tutoring. And those are things that I think a lot of districts across New Jersey and the country are gonna do. But one point I would make is that it's really gonna come down to quality, to how well these programs are implemented. There was one study, for example, that found that high dosage tutoring where kids get multiple sessions a week in very small groups, that can be 15 or 20 times more effective than less frequent tutoring. So if they just do what they've normally done, if it's not more intense or, or higher quality than the past, there's a good chance it's not gonna help students catch up. Do, will any of this, I guess, lack of transparency, Patrick, affect the district in its standing to receive right now about $40 million in federal funds 
to help with learning loss? I mean, could they take a hit because of this? You know, I don't think that that will directly impact the funding that should already be on its way. And in fact, I think the district is sharing some of that, uh, some of this data with um, the state and with the federal government. It's really with the public, with parents, with teachers. They are the ones who really haven't seen this district level data and how students are doing. And they're the folks who would like to know more about how it's going. All right, Patrick Wall, thanks for talking to us today. Thank you. And finally tonight, another Springsteen on the big stage, and this time it's the U.S. Olympics. Jessica Springsteen, daughter of the boss, legendary rock star and Jersey guy Bruce Springsteen is heading to the Tokyo Olympics, one of four members on the American show jumping team. The 29-year-old began riding horses when she was four at the family's farm in Colts Neck and now ranks number three on the U.S. rider list, number 27 in the world, not bad. Her trusty partner, a 12-year-old Belgian warm-blood stallion, his name, Don Juan Van de Don Quixote. Good luck to the team. And a reminder before we leave you, Chatbox with David Cruz is back this week, featuring a special exit interview with outgoing Attorney General Grabeer Graywall, live Thursday night at 6.30 p.m. on the NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel. Send your questions and join the chat. I'm Brianna Venosi. For the entire news team, thanks for being here. We'll see you tomorrow. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And the Ocean Wind Project by Orsted and PSEG committed to the creation of a new, long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. Have some water. Look at these kids. How are you? What do you see? I see myself. I became an ESL teacher to give my students what I wanted when I came to this country. The opportunity to learn, to dream, to achieve, a chance to belong and to be an American. My name is Julia Toriani Crompton and I'm proud to be an NJEA member.